Well, happy well, Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We're going to uh, open again with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence as we again look at the crisis ahead. We know, Lord, that we need a revelation of Jesus Christ, that a faith and a confidence to trust in you in spite of what we see around us, in spite of what we see in ourselves. Give us wisdom and understanding. I pray for each one as we study that your Holy Spirit can speak to them, that you can speak to us individually, and that we can come into harmony with you and with one another. And be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so reading through uh, this <clears throat> booklet by um, Robert W. Olson, he's got this question and answer form. And so we're just going to carry on where we had left off before, dealing with the miracles that, uh, the false miracles that are going to be done by Satan and his, his agents in, at the time of the end in our time. So we know in the time of Christ that miracles were evidence that Christ was from God. But we know that as the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth, Satan will have the power to appear to do miracles. And many who have rejected God will use this as evidence that, um, that they are in the right. And this will be as a weight used against those who are truly following God. Right. So we're going to have this overmastering delusion. And so this this is going to occur at the end of times where God's people, in spite of what appears to be the situation, that they are the outcast of the earth and that this being that appears, uh, which is Satan, uh, who personates Christ, appears to be Christ from human sight but does not have the character of Christ, even though some things are going to be parallel. Uh, those that have learned to trust in Christ will see themselves as sinners, even though Christ has declared them righteous and they're not going to sin. Their dependence is upon God. And the wicked, of course, will think that they're all okay. So anyway, that's the context in which we're, he's asking this question. Can we expect a cessation of these lying wonders once they have began? Uh, we are warned that in the last days he will work with signs and lying wonders and he will continue these wonders until the close of probation that he might point to them as evidence that he is an angel of light and not of darkness. So I'm not sure how he's looking at this. Is he saying that they end at the close of probation? Um, because we have other statements where Ellen White's pretty clear that this this deception continues after the close of probation. So I'm not really sure if he's taking this statement to mean that they end or that they don't end. So, I mean, obviously they end at some point. Okay, what Elijah-type miracle will be performed by some of Satan's devoted followers? It is stated in the word that the enemy will work through his agents who have departed from the faith, and they will seemingly work miracles, even to the bringing down of fire out of heaven in the sight of men. We must not trust the claims of man. They may, as Christ represents, profess to work miracles in healing the sick. Is this marvelous when just behind them stands the great deceiver, the miracle worker who will yet bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men? I saw that soon it would be considered blasphemy to speak against the wrapping and that it would spread more and more, that Satan's power would increase and some of his devoted followers would have power to work miracles and even to bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. But th by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, uh, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Revelation 13:13. 13, 13. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. It is the lying wonders of the devil that will take the world captive, and he will cause fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men. He is to work miracles, and this wonderful miracle working power is to sweep in the whole world. He claims to be Christ, and he is coming in, pretending to be the great medical missionary. 
He will cause fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men and prove that he is God. Okay, so um, so we can see that we, we have this contrast of, of God's people doing miracles and Satan's uh, agents doing miracles and Satan himself. Um, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do, Revelation 13, 13 and 14. No mere impostures are here foretold. Men are deceived by the miracles which Satan's agents have power to do, not which they pretend to do. So there are certain miracles that Satan is going to have power to do. Right. Obviously, he can't truly heal the sick, except things that he has brought upon them. But he still can do miracles at this time. He will be able to do perform miracles. Uh, how will the enemies of Christ look upon the ability to perform miracles? Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. And the enemies of Christ, by the instigation of Satan, request them to show some miracle. They should answer them as meekly as the Son of God answered Satan. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If they will not be convinced by inspired testimony, a manifestation of God's power would not benefit them. So one of the things we see here uh, is we know in the time of Christ, were miracles evidence that Jesus was the Son of God? Yes. Okay. So why in the last days is Satan allowed to do miracles? Why this difference from the first coming and the second coming? He must he must be allowed to manifest fully his character of deception. Okay. So there is a work that's being done as far as something's being made clear to people at the end of time. So Satan is being unmasked. To to people and to the theater of the universe, to all the worlds. When Jesus said, I will draw all, he meant all created worlds, Stephen. Okay. Now, now what about, um, you know, if we look at the story of Thomas. So Thomas, he said, you know, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my hand in his side, right, I will not believe, right, that Christ has, resurrected, has risen, right? Now, then he sees Jesus, and Jesus says, you know, feel the prince in my hands, put your hand in my side. You have seen and believed, blessed is he that has not seen and believed. Is there something about the truth that's being presented at the end of time that needs to transcend sight? That we have so to have that's different. Okay, somebody said something. Stephen? Yes, I would say that... Uh... The miracles Satan has been allowed to to, to do uh, mm -hmm. would be like a test for the people in the last days whether they're going to trust in sight or walk by faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trust now, in the word of God. Okay, yeah. So, so we go back to, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. So God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. To, to test his people, right? To test Adam and Eve. Why did he do that? Why would he put that tree there? Sort of to give them the option to obey or not to obey. Okay, well, you know, I mean, he, he didn't have to put a tree there. I mean, he could have just, I mean, he, he, he gave Satan access to them through that tree. So, you know, it... it, it I'm sort of playing the devil's advocate here, which um, is a bit of a pun as well, uh, or a reference. But um, isn't it that um, if God hadn't done that, would Adam and Eve sinned, right? Why is he having this access to Satan in order to test them, right? I mean, he could have just left them alone, and, and maybe sin would have arisen eventually at some point just as it did in heaven. But, but why this issue with Satan? Well, the other angels did it to sort of um, see something of Satan's ways, in the sense that was, uh, things had to be played out. Satan's character was going to be displayed to them. Okay. Just I believe 
Yeah, just hang on. I have to pause. I'm, I'm going to come back to that. Just keep your thought. Uh, in my study of this here, Ellen White says there was other worlds with other trees as well. So the earth was not sort of different from the way God had created other intelligences in other worlds. Uh, only this time that, that you have Satan now at the tree tempting. So I don't believe Satan was at the other trees. He had maybe in mind to tempt the other worlds after he had maybe uh, captured or uh, got the obedience to him of uh, Adam, tempted them. But um, Satan was uh, had his mind just focused on uh, tempting Adam and Eve rather than the other worlds. And um, maybe that could be seen as unfair that the other worlds didn't have Satan at their trees to tempt them. But uh, God had gave Adam and Eve a warning. Angels, two angels had come down and warned Adam and Eve of uh, that what had taken place and had uh, warned them of uh, Lucifer's plans that he was going to come to the earth to try to tempt them. Okay, so so the reason why Satan is there, why God is, is having Adam and Eve have access to Satan, is it's on this earth that God is going to work out his plan of salvation that's going to undo the work of Satan. Well, that comes of it, yes. Yeah. So, so we see that this issue of Satan... It, it, as far as this world is concerned, is that this this is um, this is a special place in that context, right? So at the end of time, Satan is going to be given another opportunity to deceive these people that Christ has redeemed, right? Yes. Do we see how this how this works? Why this is at the end of the world? Why this final test? Because Sin has come, you know, into the universe through Satan. God has created this earth and, and Adam and Eve in order to counteract this work of Satan. I mean, there's lots of thoughts that, that come with this, but it's, it's not just some arbitrary thing where, you know, Satan is now allowed to do miracles. It has to do with the progression of the plan of salvation. Now, we were talking a bit about it last night as far as uh, the atonement, right? So we know that there's this work of atonement that, uh, you know, that begins from the foundation of the world. Jesus has offered himself to come and die. But there is a work that has to be completed in his people before he can come the second time. So when he came, came the first time, came and died for our sins. Um, and now he's our high priest ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. And when probation closes, uh, there is that, um, can't remember the, the article. I think it's from the Spalding McGann collection. We had addressed it when we studied early writings, page 74. And, and in that vision Ellen White had in 1850, it's going to describe when Christ takes those sins that have been cleansed, you know, from the sanctuary, from, from God's people that he has cleansed, and he places them upon the head of the scapegoat, that that Satan is, is seeking to escape, right? That it is from, from his response, like if he could succeed, if Satan could succeed to get God's people to sin, he would be victorious, right? That's the idea. I, I should find that that statement because it was quite interesting. Um, where would that be? Uh, well, maybe I'll do it this way. This way. Yeah, I don't know where it would be. Do you remember that, Dwight, where we had... Um, Which one are you looking for? Well, it was in Spalding McGann. It was the one that she had in 1850, the vision regarding Satan trying to seek to escape. Uh, in reference to the scapegoat. Oh, look, I don't remember it. Okay. Um, where do I find Spalding again in the E.G. White disc? Where is it? Ain't it under pamphlets? It's under pamphlets? 
Uh, I think so. I I think so. Well, I could probably find it this way. Yeah. It's under uh, miscellaneous collections. Oh, okay. That's okay. There it is. Spalding McGann. There we got it. Yeah. So it's in this document. Okay, here it is. So this is Spalding and McGann, page two, paragraph one. Then the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward and issue a decree that all who will not observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh day shall be slain. And the Catholics whose numbers are large will stand by the Protestants. The Catholics will give their power to the image of the beast and the Protestants will work as their mother worked before them to destroy the saints. But before their decree bring or bear fruit, the saints will be delivered by the voice of God. Then I saw that Jesus' work in the sanctuary will soon be finished. And after his work there is finished, he will come to the door of the first apartment and confess the sins of Israel upon the head of the scapegoat. Then he will put on the garments of vengeance. Then the plagues will come upon the wicked, and they do not come till Jesus puts on that garment and takes his place upon the white cloud. Then, while the plagues are falling, the scapegoat is being led away. He makes a mighty struggle to escape, but he is held fast by the hand that leads him. If he should effect his escape, Israel would lose their lives. I saw that it would take time to lead away the scapegoat into the land of forgetfulness after the sins were put on his head. Right. So obviously the way in which she's writing this is is, you know, very basic. Right. Not a lot of detail here. But the basic idea here is that Satan has to be dealt with and. So this period in which he's going to struggle to escape is that period in which God's peoples are tested, right? This is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. So she goes on, the great white cloud I saw was not the holy place, but entirely separate from the holy and most holy place and entirely separate from the sanctuary. Then the angel repeated these words and said, this is the time spoken of in Isaiah. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. He had no mediator between God and man, and these plagues could be withheld no longer, for Jesus had ceased to plead for Israel, and they were covered with the covering of the Almighty God, and then they could live in the sight of a holy God. And those who were not covered, the plagues fell upon them, for they had nothing to shelter or protect them from the wrath of God. Right. And so this, this is that um, vision that's on October 23rd, 1850. So it's the same vision uh, that's recorded in early writings page 74 it's just an extended version of it right so that's where we had found this it's uh, uh, another writing of that vision okay so so i know we, we've taken a little bit of a departure here but one of the things that we can see is that uh, this idea that satan can perform miracles there's a purpose in it right so how will the enemies of Christ look upon the ability to perform miracles? Papists who boast that miracles is a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder working power. So you can see then, right, coming back to this, that people are going to be convinced by miracles. And the, the reason why they are convinced by miracles is they're not, they're not concerned about what God's word says, right? If they're not convinced by the inspired testimony, the next one, the manifestation of God's power would not benefit them. Right. So God is not going to use miracles because they have other testimony as to what is true. Any thoughts on that? Would it not be that just Satan has more power to do miracles and know that he's been doing miracles pretty much throughout history? In a sense, but it just increases his ability. Well, yeah, I understand what you're saying, especially because people, you know, God's spirit is withdrawn. He has more people under his control. But I, I don't think it's just that. I think God is allowing it specifically to happen in this way, right? I mean, we know with uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, um, God didn't allow the priests of Baal to have fire come down from heaven and consume their sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. But they are, Satan will be able to bring fire down from heaven 
at the end of time, something he couldn't do in the past. And we know there are restrictions. For instance, when Satan personates Christ, he will not be allowed to, to come in the clouds of heaven as Christ came, right? You know, mm-hmm. God's not going to allow that to happen. But, you know, he'll still come in different places on the earth, right? So it goes contrary to what's said in the scriptures. So if somebody is founded upon the word of God in their experience, but not just knowing certain things like, you know, about how Jesus comes back, but actually has a living faith, they will be able to stand against these deceptions, resist them. Unbelievers will require them to do some miracle if they believe God's special power is in the church and that they are the chosen people of God. Unbelievers who are afflicted with infirmities will require them to work a miracle upon them if God is with them. Christ's followers should imitate the example of their Lord. Jesus, with his divine power, did not do any mighty works for Satan's diversion. Neither can the servants of Christ. They should refer the unbelieving to the written, inspired testimony for evidence of their being the loyal people of God and heirs of salvation. So who will the multitude think is working so marvelously in their churches? Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work, and before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Now, when I when I read this statement and I think about, you know, back 40 some years ago when I first read this and what I see happening today. We are having a religious interest. You know, I watched a video recently, um, Dr. Jordan Peterson and uh, Russell Brand, you know, were doing a prayer for America, you know, and, and Russell Brand, you know, who's recently been baptized as a Christian of some sort, you know, said the Lord's Prayer, right? In this uh, video I was watching, they're making a big deal about what's happening there. Now, now, what I think is that there are there is true revival occurring, but we also have false revival. And, and it's hard, I think, for the average person to really distinguish between the two. So what would characterize a false revival compared to a true revival? A repentance. <laughs> OK, so, so a lot of repentance. OK. So repentance would be one. Is there true repentance? Is a person actually changing his life, not just talking about what miracles God is doing? And, you know, I know lots of Christians. Um, I've known lots of Christians through the years, and I know Christians today who really focus upon miracles and spiritual manifestations, and yet don't appear to have any repentance for their own sins, right? Satan is always, you know, uh, doing bad things to them, but none of it's ever because of the decisions they make, even though it's pretty evident that it's the decisions that they've made that are causing their problems. So obviously a true revival will work repentance. What other things would distinguish the true from the false? I mean, it's sort of related to repentance, but the focus would be upon our own sins and not the sins of others, right? Yeah, and uh, looking for temporal prosperity, temporal kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, obviously people who are looking for for God's blessings as part of just becoming a Christian that, you know, God is going to bless me. And and I see that so much in the Christian world. You know, when I look at, uh, you know, and I'm trying to judge, you know, like Jordan Peterson and Russell Brand, I'm trying to judge, you know, what, what kind of thing is actually happening there? And, and it appears to me, from my limited knowledge of them as individuals, just what you see on the Internet, 
that there seems to be a true type of repentance and that it's not about, you know, prosperity at this point. Whether that's going to always be consistent or not, I don't know. But I've seen many of these, you know, intellectuals who are now being converted to Christ, I see in them, you know, what appears to be a spirit of repentance. So, I mean, we have to sort of see where all this is leading. But I see in a lot of the Christians who are looking to these men to um, start a religious revival, quite a different spirit. So so there's kind of a mixture of, of what's going on. There are some individuals who are becoming Christians, but not really, right? So we know that there's going to be a counterfeit. And, and I guess for us not to be deceived is to know God's word, right? To have a living experience with Christ. Because it, it's not easy in this world to sort out what's true and what's false. I mean, we all know that, right? If, if we didn't know it before 2020, we de definitely know it now. And, and so the question that we have to ask is, how are we not going to be deceived? And, and for some people, it's like knowing certain facts, right? You know, how Jesus is going to come back and that, you know, Saturday's the Sabbath and I'm never going to be deceived. But can we see that we can easily be deceived, even if we have an understanding of the truth, you know, in an intellectual sense, but we've never been truly converted, right? Just the knowledge, knowledge, no heart change. Yeah. Yeah. Because... What, what is it that we are looking, if we're looking to see ourselves as sinners, if we're looking to be changed, I don't think we can be deceived. But if we're looking to justify ourselves, we will be deceived. Satan will provide a, a religion for us that, that is going to appeal to our human nature. And we know that the cross is the thing uh, that is the hardest for a Christian to have to take up your cross daily and follow him. And, and I believe that many people who, who are truly converted, that God has worked upon their heart, they will stand on the right side of these issues as time goes on, as these two classes uh, form. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it's not something where you can just say, you know, here's what you need to know in order to not be deceived, unless you're saying, here's who you need to know in an intimate way. You need to know Christ. You need to take up your yoke. His, you know, you, you need to take up your cross. You need to yoke up with Christ. And then you need not fear about being deceived. Before the loud cry of the third angel is given, he, Satan, raises an excitement in these religious bodies that those who have rejected the truth may think that God is with them. He hopes to deceive the honest and lead them to think that God is still working for the churches. But the light will shine on all who are honest, and all who are honest will leave the fallen churches and take their stand with the remnant. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. Now, now she says here through the agency of spiritualism. Now, what specifically is that? What does she mean by through the agency of spiritualism? Miracles will be wrought. How do we define spiritualism? I think of like uh, seances and Ouija boards and that type of thing. Okay. When we think of that, but is that all? <laughs> I mean, that's obviously where it st starts. Um, but we but we can see spiritualism within Christianity, right? And and when we think of the agency of spiritualism, hypnotism, different types of meditation techniques, and so forth. You know, one of the things that worries me about Dr. Jordan Peterson is, you know, this talk about uh, 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 things like LSD and so forth as a way of getting some kind of spiritual insight. And, um, you know, this sort of subjective experience that people can have is, is, I think, a danger because 
It needs to be founded upon the word of God, our experience with Christ. So, so through the agency of spiritualism, you know, we think of the new age, but spiritualism has taken over lots of religions. I, I remember I had a guitar student once. I used to teach people in their homes. And, and uh, anyway, I went to his house and uh, he, he was not a Christian, but somehow he went to some Christian camp. And uh, he ended up receiving the gift of tongues. And, and he was kind of like telling me about this. But, I mean, he was not Christian in any way whatsoever. Um, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, he didn't know what it even meant to be a Christian. So, so for some people, that type of manifestation, uh, you know, being slain in the spirit or different types of things that you see in some churches, to them, that's what being a Christian is. But we know that being a Christian means to be Christ-like, to represent Christ. So, so when I think of spiritualism, it's just opposed to God's law. Right? It's opposed to his word. <clears throat> and so definitely uh, uh, satanic agencies will be at work. Will miracles also accompany the ministry of God's people during the loud cry? So the loud cry from time of the Sunday law to the close of probation. In visions of the night, representations passed before me of a great performatory movement among God's people. Many were praising God. The sick were healed and other miracles were wrought. A spirit of intercession was seen, even as was manifested before the great day of Pentecost. Hundreds and thousands, and thousands, hundreds and thousands, were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and as a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest, and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest, on every side doors were thrown open to the proclamation of the truth. The world seemed to be lightened with the heavenly influence. Great blessings were received by the true and humble people of God. So here we're going to see that there is these, these a true revival and a false revival occurring at the same time, Right? And, and the fruit of a true revival is genuine conversion, right? A spirit of intercession, uh, hearts that are convicted, right? Convicted not just intellectually of ideas, but of the, uh, of their sins through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can see that there, the, that there is light that comes with that. Um, so the question is asked and, and Angela has a little comment here dealing with, uh, that uh, spiritualism can also be believing that spirits with whom I con with whom one consorts are benefactors or will do one's bidding. Yes, yeah, so there is talking to uh, spirits, which is part of spiritualism. Um, and I've seen that with Christians who have this sort of their, you know, this whoever is talking to them that they think is talking to them, which is not God, that's for sure. But anyway. How should we regard miracles? Will they be a test as they were in Elijah's day? The way in which Christ worked at, was to preach the word and to relieve suffering by miraculous works of healing. But I'm instructed that we cannot now work in this way, for Satan will exercise his power by working miracles. God's servants today could not work by means of miracles because spurious works of healing, claiming to be divine, will be wrought. If we accept not the truth in the love of it, we may be among the number who will see the miracles wrought by Satan in these last days and believe them. Many strange things will appear as wonderful miracles, which should be regarded as deceptions manufactured by the father of lies. Satan, surrounded by evil angels and claiming to be God, will work miracles of all kinds to deceive, if possible, the very elect. God's people will not find their safety in working miracles, for Satan will counterfeit the miracles that will be wrought. So, what she means here is obviously to do miracles as an evidence uh, that you're being led of God. Now, we, miracles will happen. People will be healed, but it's not going to be used as evidence. How can we tell the true from the false? If those through whom cures are performed are disposed on account of these manifestations to excuse their neglect of the law of God and continue in disobedience, Though they have power to any and every extent, it does not follow that they have the great power of God. 
On the contrary, it is the miracle working power of the great deceiver. That is, the connection between obedience to God and healing, uh, it should it should bear fruit that leads to obedience to God. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is for, to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. The Bible will never be superseded by miraculous manifestations. Now, of course, we all are familiar with, you know, people who claim to be led of God, yet directly contradict God's word. They use miracles, signs um, as evidence that they are godly, and yet uh, they uh, reject the plain teachings of the scriptures, right? So the Bible is our standard. It's something that's objective, not what we see. Now, a question which just comes to mind. So dealing with this movement, we've dealt a lot with um, chronology, and we have all these dates and all of these structures. How, uh, and some people have even taken the position uh, in opposed to what we have done, that what we're doing is is basically satanic, that that everything that God has done in this movement, all of these these evidences through these prophetic lines, or just a deception. Uh, how would we argue against that? How is how can we show that what God has been doing in this movement is not part of Satan's deceptions? Right. So take something like um, Revelation nine. We deal with the prophecy of Revelation nine, and we have evidence that that prophecy was fulfilled uh, August eleventh, eighteen forty, and from that we. Uh, get these symbols that we use in our history. How, how do we know that that's not just some deception, that Satan isn't using dates and numbers in some magical way in this movement? That it's, that it's not a deception based on these, these statements here that we've just read. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know about proving it to everyone, but for personal proof, I mean, I get these numbers that come up, you know, 187, 1888, uh, 9-11. All three of those numbers came up during a time in my life where I was I was humbled in the dust, um, lifted up again, only humbly, and only others be lifted up at the same time. So those numbers come in sync with changes in my life that were unmistakable evidence of God's leading. That's my personal evidence. Now, to others, I'm not sure. We're not talking about necessarily to others. We're talking about to ourselves. Are we deceived? Right? That's the question we need to ask. And um, so one is we would see a fruit that happens in the manifestation of our characters, right? The conviction of sin that comes, right? That is pointing people to the scriptures and to God's word. That, that what we have studied agrees with the light that was given in the past. It makes things shine brighter, right? It doesn't, it doesn't bring darkness. Because if what we were teaching contradicted the scriptures, then we would have to be concerned that it's a deception, right? So now, are there counterfeits of what we are doing? And, and definitely they, there are. So even before I, uh, um, you know, got really involved in, in, in studying all these things, I've, I've always kept my eye on Protestants' understanding of Bible chronology and, and, and Bible prophecy. So very familiar with lots of different views. And, um, and then when I started studying the chronology, there was all of these systems, people using numbers in symbolic ways. We see it, but they misinterpret the scriptures. That is, they can see some of, and some of them maybe are seeing things that are true, but they're not putting it all together. So there, 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 there are counterfeits in what, what we have done, right? I see people using gematria and, uh, but when we use these, 
when we look at this chronology, the purpose is not uh, to prove God's word by coincidences. Right? You understand what I'm talking about? We understand God's word and God shows us for us individually and for us as a movement, his leading, but they're not the evidences. They're not our main argument for what we believe. I kind of think of it like the cherry on top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it's something I've thought about a lot, right? Because obviously I'm pretty involved in this and then I never want to deceive anyone. And I don't want to be deceived either. But it's it's all in God's providence. It unfolds so miraculously. And that's why I did that series on uh, the symbolic use of numbers, just to go through the history of what had happened. And And what we see is that God has been leading this movement to shield us uh, from the deceptions that we have seen people falling into all around us. So every time God was showing us something, it was uh, to keep us from deception. And then we saw the people going off into darkness who rejected the light. And so that becomes real evidence of, of the power of the truth, just seeing the fruit of those who accept light and those who reject light. So it, it, it's something that you know we, we all need to consider. We don't want to be deceived, and we definitely don't want to deceive others. And, and so we need to examine uh, the scriptures. We need to examine everything, and we need to take our time. You know, if, if something is true, I need to know it. But I also need to know if it's not true, right? There's something that I believe that is in error. Um, I need to know it. And I've spent a lot of my life examining the evidences to see whether I'm deceived or not in what I believe. And subjective experience is not enough. You know, how I feel is not enough. Right? It needs to be founded upon God's word. Um, so this last one here, probably this question, what is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion? Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the dis under the guise of departed friends. Through spiritualism, many of the sick, the bereaved, the curious, are communicating with evil spirits. All who venture to do this are on dangerous ground. Now, it's not part of my experience at all. I've never had any real experience with uh, any type of mystical spiritualism stuff. Uh, the closest I've had was when I had a uh, when I was working for the city of Edmonton social services and I had this old lady who uh, I would help her do her shopping and shovel her sidewalk and stuff like this. And uh, I was at her house after helping her do some shopping, putting away groceries. And, and she was completely like delusional. I mean, she believed there was people in the back alley revving a car all night and working on, there's no car back in her back alley, right? And then she wanted to read my palm. And I don't know why I'd let her do it. Um, I was just kind of humoring her, right? She said she used to do palm reading and all this. But it's something I wish I never did because the things she said to me were definitely not from her mind. And they definitely came directly from Satan. And I recognized right away. So I would never do something like that again. But, uh, and, and one is she became very lucid at that moment when she was reading my palm. She had to have this huge magnifying glass with this light and everything to see anything. But, um, so we, we shouldn't play around with things like that. You know, Satan has the power to deceive through his lying wonders, right? And, um, I just recognized what she said that it appealed to, uh, my human nature. It appealed to a part of me that, uh, you know, was was definitely Satan's temptation. So, um, so anyway, it, when we have things like uh, uh, evil angels come from the form of loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living, in this way they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. 
These evil angels, who assume to be de deceased friends, are regarded with a certain idolatry, and with their word, and with many, their word has greater weight than the word of God. And often we see this. Um, demons will say, you know, that Jesus is just another person, uh, you know, in heaven or, you know, is some special place. But basically the idea is that we're all godlike in some, some fashion or other. That totally contradicts the word of God. Um, but people are deceived by these things. And, and much of Christianity is, is no different in how it appeals to uh, our human nature. So any, any final thoughts on, on this topic? Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. We know, Lord, that you are marvelous. And we know Satan has sought to deceive us and has many times. But we know, Lord, that your truth, your word, um, can heal us. We pray that we can live in honesty to you, that we can be honest about our sins, and that we can confess them. We pray that we can be an influence for good. Help us, Lord, to focus upon what you are doing in our lives and to cooperate with you in that work. We pray for one another that your angels can watch over us and that we cannot fear him that can destroy the body, but that we can truly fear God and um, that we can keep his commandments. So we pray, Lord, that we can obey your voice and that uh, Christ can live in our hearts by faith. Be with each person throughout this Sabbath, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.